This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 42, recorded on September 20th, 2012. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, howdy. I missed you guys, but I'm very happy about the job you did at ECAC. It was really stupendous. You know, when, you. Uh, when you're not around, we worry that we don't meet your standards. Uh, you <laughs> far surpassed them. <laughs> yeah, we did miss you. We're glad to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. But San Diego was well represented. It sure was. We it had sure Victor was. Nize yeah. from San Diego, and his uh, introduction and uh, contribution, I think, was well received by the audience, and hopefully the listeners have had an opportunity to hear what he's had to say. So San Diego was well represented. Of course, everyone recognizes that voice. Uh, that is, of course, Michael Schmidt from the Medical University of South Carolina. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. I hear your voice is even recognized in France. It uh. is. <laughs> Let's introduce our guest, and then you can share that with us. How's that? Okay. Today we have a guest who is also from the Medical University of South Carolina. He's a professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases, Joseph John. Thank you very much. It's a delight, uh, really a delight to be here. And I've admired uh, Elio's work for many years and, of course, have enjoyed working with Michael for many years. So it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and participate. Great Thank to you. have you. So you're a colleague of Michael's there, is that right? Yeah, for quite a while. And uh, I've uh, centered my activity mostly at our, at our Veterans Hospital here, which is uh, the major affiliate of our, uh, our university here, our medical university. Wow. Well, welcome and thanks for joining us uh, at the last minute, I guess. Michael twisted your arm. My pleasure. So, Michael, tell us that story. Well, uh, Dr. John and I did the traditional thing that everyone should do after they get along get off of a long transatlantic flight is you go for a good long walk to work the clots out of your legs. And <laughs> so as we were walking through the streets of Lyon, you do what all most American tourists do while they're overseas is you happen to wander into a cathedral to view the relics. And um, we were talking amongst ourselves very quietly, but this nice young lady came up to me uh, at the reception for the conference that evening, and she said, I recognized you at the cathedral. I heard your <laughs> voice, and I immediately knew you were you. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm a, continually amazed at how small the world really is when you wander around and, and you get recognized. And uh, she, ho she so happened to be from the University of Iowa, where, um, and in fact, you at that very moment uh, were interviewing one of her faculty members on the small, on the uh, TWIM that you conducted at Cold Spring Harbor. Right. So it was really a, a great opportunity. And one other thing I like to volunteer about Joe is um, he's actually one of the few physicians in South Carolina that has uh, expertise in chronic fatigue syndrome. Wow. Uh, wow. I know that was one of your topics uh, for your past TWIV. That's right. Uh, the uh, multi-center trial that was coordinated by Ian Lipkin just came out, so I took the opportunity to, to interview him about that. What did you think about that outcome, Joe? I, you, guess, uh, uh, you would guess that it's probably the most uh, celebrated negative data that has, uh, has hit, the, <laughs> the, the, hit the wavelengths for a while. 
and you know, for our listeners who 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 don't know the very short story, that there was a retrovirus supposedly found in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, and this was a a, a look back into another group of sera, and they found no evidence of this murine-like retrovirus. So, for millions of chronic fatigue sufferers, of course, it was terrible news. And yeah. but that's the way science sometimes is. You get you get the bad news and you plunge and you plunge forward and chronic fatigue sufferers are really a resilient group and they're always living in hope. Mm. That that virus XMRV had originally been discovered in prostate tumors. Indeed. And yes. so just yesterday a paper came out where they also found that this virus is not present in prostate tumors and that it was likely introduced into the original specimens by contamination uh, at the Cleveland Clinic. Oh boy. So the whole story is wrapped up, and this is not a bona fide human pathogen by any means. In, in, in many measures, of course, that's good because we don't, we don't want to see these uh, strange retro uh, viruses jump too much into our yeah. genomes. Yeah. They're doing plenty of that. Already. That's true. For sure. That's true. Well, Michael, you and I were at ICAC. We were standing in the poster area, and you regaled me with this story of your voice being... Uh, recognized and from that i said what were you doing in leon and that from that i discovered you were at this symposium on staphylococci and staphylococcal infections and i think we talked for about an hour about it and i said you know we should have recorded this uh, <laughs> because it was a great conversation but let's do it again uh, you come on to twim and tell us all about the meeting and so that's what we're planning to do today is have you and joe give us a little flavor for the meeting and alio and I will uh, will torture you, as you like to call it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give the color commentary. That's right. <laughs> the the color commentary will be most welcome. I, I, Alio, I, I got to tell you, when I said to Michael, uh, can you do this? He said, yeah, it's okay. You and Alio can torture me. <laughs> it's, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like going through your oral qualifying exams over and over again. But <laughs> it really is... Um, a delight to attend these scientific conferences that are specifically organized around one microbe. And we have very few of these conferences any longer because it's very expensive to go to meetings. So this was the 15th International Symposium on Staphylococci and Staphylococcal Infections. And it's really a self-organized group. These are the leading laboratories in the world that are working on, on staff. And they really have a unique perspective of looking at this particular microbe. And for those of you unfamiliar with um, Staphylococcus, it's, it's really a pathogen slash commensal of humans. It's, it's one and the same. It's both a commensal as well as a, a pathogen. And specifically, Staph aureus or Staphylococcus aureus is, is really the pathogen. And, of course, Staphylococcus epidermidis is, of course, the commensal. But together, this genus with these two very dominant species really have a lot to teach us about our immune system, potentially the microbiome. And I sat listening to the oral presentations as well as going to the the poster sessions that were chock-a-block full of, of people at all times and was really amazed. Um, how, many way, people, how many people go to this meeting, Michael? There were 555 scientists and there were... All over. From all over. From, from all over the world. And... The Europeans um, uh, were fortunate enough to bring a large contingent of their laboratories. It was a competitive process as to whether or not you got a poster accepted. Uh, the, your chances of getting a talk were extremely slim because, you know, so much science, so little time. And it was really a, a rigorous process. And the organizers of the meeting uh, – Jerome Etienne and Francois, and I'm going to butcher his name, Joe, so I'll let Van you. Nesh. Van der Nesh. Uh, were the organizers, and uh, Jerome Etienne is, is the dean of the, uh, the Claude Bernard uh, Medical School, 
at the University of Lyon in France. And uh, for a dean to still have an active laboratory, it, it gives you um, a great deal of uh, respect for... It's un-American. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he was active in the meeting. Uh, he has an active laboratory. So it was uh, really quite a treat. Uh, one of the... Um, leaders in the field of staphylococci, uh, George Peters, or Georg Peters from Munster, Germany, kicked off the conference on Sunday night with a terrific perspective talk that set the stage for the quality and the quantity of the science that has resulted since the conference last met, which was held in Bath, England in 2010. And Georg went through this tremendous perspective, and I think that's what I most appreciated about the oral presentations. There was raw data as well as a great discussion of what this meant in the context of the big picture. One of the most memorable metaphors that I took from Dr. Peter's talk was, uh, and he said, strains of Staphylococcus aureus that produce high amounts of alpha homolysin will melt the endocardium of humans like butter in the sun on a summer day. That fast and that irreversible. It's all about how alpha toxin breaks down barriers. And, you know, when you think about it, staph is not known for its homolysin activity because we don't talk about it when we introduce homolysis to medical students when we talk about the more famous of the hemolytic microbes, and that's, of course, strep, because we all talk about beta homolysis. But I think if a strain produces high amounts of alpha homolysin that can melt our endocardium like butter in the sun on a summer day, it really puts into perspective how remarkable Staph aureus is as a pathogen to to really go after and uh, take things out. That's not the same as the Panton Valentine leukocytin, is it? It's something no. else, isn't it? Something else, and that that Panton Valentine toxin is uh, what really brought the Lyon lab to uh, notoriety, uh, since they've made claims for many years that um, necrotizing pneumonia with Staph aureus is primarily me mediated through. Uh, that that particular leukocidin, which is one of nine or ten leukocidins that this starship Galactica <laughs> that we we know as Staph aureus can produce. So, Joe, do you work on uh, Staph Staphylococci? I, I do. I, I have kind of an equal interest in uh, Staph aureus uh, as well as the coagulase negative Staphylococci. There are now about sixteen species of coagulase negative Staph Staphylococci that infect humans. But, you know, from a clinical point of view, we have to keep our, our hand in there to uh, uh, remain expert on, on methicillin-resistant staph aureus as well as all the methicillin-susceptible uh, strains. Uh, this meeting has historically really concentrated on the coag-positive form, the staph aureus form. But uh, as a matter of fact, in all of our hospitals, particularly in, in the Western countries, the most common uh, bloodstream isolate, be it real or a, uh, a false positive, are these coagulase negative staphylococci. Oh, wow. And uh, we, we heard a lot about uh, interactions between staph epi and uh, staph aureus. So just for the listeners who aren't familiar with this, can you give us an overview of staph aureus and staph epidermidis with respect to human carriage, for example? Sure. Almost everybody carries the staph epi in their nose, and only about 30% of humans carry staph aureus. Uh, the ones that carry staph aureus either carry it as permanent uh, carriers or as intermittent carriers, uh, that approach being made famous by another big group represented at the, uh, uh, we'll call it ISSI, ISSI meetings uh, from uh, Rotterdam at the uh, Erasmus University. Mm -hmm. So they've really discovered it's taken about 20 years and a cohort of about 30,000 Rotterdamians to uh, to establish that people are either permanent carriers, intermittent carriers, or non-carriers. And that may perk up our listeners' ears to the idea that what the heck is a non-carrier? That is, do you really be, come and stay a non-carrier? And the, the short answer is probably. And the, and the long answer about being a carrier 
is that you don't get infected, particularly in the community, with Staph aureus unless you're a carrier. The implication meaning that you're getting you're getting uh, colonized and infected by your uh, by your own strain. Staph epi, on the other hand, especially from one of the presentations at this meeting, seems to almost be the yang of the ying, and that it offsets not only uh, the uh, uh, the quality of whether you're carrying staph aureus, that is whether you're a carrier or not, but also the quantity. So staph epi may ultimately be over the next decade hmm. a way to inhibit uh, large carriage of, of staph aureus. Um, years ago in the 60s, uh, a, a Swedish investigator by the name of Solberg did landmark studies showing that we're either a low quantity carrier or medium quantity carrier or what's called a shedder. So some of our fellow human beings around us are constantly shooting this staph aureus uh, into the air so that other people can become colonized uh, and therefore the perpetuation of this, as Michael so ap aptly described, this commensal which becomes a, uh, a pathogen. Staph epi, on the other hand, does not have all these leukocidins, and it's really armed with these so-called microbial surface proteins called M-scrams, and those M-scrams allow staph epi to adhere and attach to particularly um, inorganic materials like titanium and plastic. It can also uh, adhere to devitalized human tissue where it then forms uh, a small and then a, a very large biofilm and we could go on and on about biofilm as just to say that's one of the big topics in this area. So here you have kind of the fast guy out of the blocks and staph aureus jumps into your bloodstream, into your tissues, does all this tissue destruction that Michael referred to, and then kind of the uh, tortoise kind of pulling up the rear at the end, but getting a very good hold on things and staying there for a long, long time. The classic example being a prosthetic joint that cannot be cured with antibiotics but ultimately has to be removed. So so the the reason why 30% of the population is is are carriers is is that understood or does it have to do with staph epi or is it more complicated than that? Well, let me I I I play the game when I go to conferences with uh, colleagues from my institution. I often ask them, "So what did you learn in school today?" And <laughs> Or what was the best talk that you've encountered? And there was a Japanese worker, and I apologize if I, I'm going to butcher his name, Tadyuki Sasawe, And he described how staph epidermis makes this factor ESP, and it inhibits staph aureus biofilm formation and nasal colonization. Mm -hmm. So here is a microbe that makes a factor, a diffusible transacting factor, in which he presented findings that shows that as this factor is secreted by a subset of staph epidermidis, it inhibits the ability of staph aureus to colonize or form um, an active, if you will, infection. And so, it's really describing this whole interference conundrum. And so as I sat there listening to him, I'm thinking about all the recent stories that we have done about the microbiome and trying to understand how things get colonized in our gut. And I'm looking at, you know, the nose is, if you will, a little bit simpler than our gut, thinking about how a member of the same genus is coordinating what species is actually going to um, take up housekeeping. And it almost su su suggests a coevolution of how humans and the microbes have begun to uh, adapt. And uh, I'll put this into the show notes, Vincent. Um, he actually published a paper in Nature on this specific topic. So if anyone's interested, they can go and in the show notes, they can take a look at his fine work that was uh, published in Nature. And what he described at this meeting is not only the data that were in the Nature paper, but how he has moved it forward um, to the next level. So is, and, it, is it simply the case that people who, who are colonized don't have staph epidermidis, or is it more complex? Well, let me ask you a question. Are they, in fact, when people have both, do, do, do you find them in the same place? Mm -hmm. I mean, staph epi is usually on the skin and staph aureus in the throat. So 
I wasn't sure I know where they meet. Yeah. Well, but you know, Elio, that um, almost everybody carries Steph Epi in their nose. So, oh, I see. In so addition to your question skin. a little bit is, what is the real niche for Staph aureus? Does it displace the... Uh, uh, does it displace Staph epi and find its own receptors? We, we, we do know already that the tychoic acid uh, repeating unit that's kind of shooting out of this Staph aureus surface, a little bit like a, um, a firework, uh, those tychoic acid molecules are, are both necessary. Well, they're, they're def definitely necessary for adhesion and to a certain, to a certain degree almost sufficient. To, to bind Staph aureus. So there have been a lot of strategies aimed at trying to, to strip the Staph aureus of its uh, tychoic acid or make one that binds that's not a, not a, um, not a pathogen. Um, and that, that's kind of been the dream over the years. But I think we're headed more towards what you implied, Elio, that with the Staph epi uh, population dynamics in the, in the anterior nares to kind of really learn to understand that and a way to exclude Staph aureus, even from those people who are genetically already defined as being <laughs> able to bind the tychoic acid of Staph aureus. Let me just ask you, uh, is the talk of using this, this compound, the, the substance ESP, which I believe is a protease, isn't it? Is there a way of spraying, spraying this into people and see if uh, Staph aureus disappears or something? I think that's where they're going. I, I yeah. think they're they're going to look for, uh, de you know, presently the way they decolonize healthcare workers is with a God-fearing antibiotic, which of course has all the implications of you know resistance emergence, whereas this is a natural product that's literally coming out of the microbe to effectively control um, the system. And in his Nature paper, he actually goes into the data describing uh, the odds ratios of S. aureus colonization in, in volunteers doing univariate analysis and looking at um, this whole thing. So this is one of those issues where I think we need to stay tuned to find out whether or not, and that, I guess, is where the meeting was really going, is uh, what's on the horizon and new uh, treatment modalities that are not traditionally antimicrobial but are specifically targeted. Uh, later in the day, just when I thought I had heard all the ohms that were ever coined, someone coined a new one. And um, they may have already coined this, and I just hadn't thought about it or heard it. They referred to the pathoglycobiome, and that goes back to it. Joe was talking about with, um, you know, the tychoic acids and what they were specifically talking about is the zwitteronic cell wall polymers of gram positive bacteria. And a zwitteronic polymer, of course, has both positive and negative charges in repeating patterns. And these are in the cell envelope and how these zwitteronic cell wall polymers interact with the immune system, of course, was the subject of that particular symposium. And so then my head's beginning to explode and y you, you really are, I, I really need to go back to organic chemistry to learn how to take notes at light speed again, <laughs> because uh -huh. I, I couldn't copy fast enough. And, you know, I went to school during the era when the faculty member wrote on the overhead projector or wrote on the chalkboard, which facilitated taking notes. Mm. But in the days of PowerPoints, you know, you're trying to copy down these structures and you're trying to think about what they're saying at the same time. And they're going through in these beautiful 20 minute talks at light speed. And you're just trying to keep up and, you know, so much science, so little time is, is what you're, looking at yeah joe Michael, just that's what that's what digital cameras are for <laughs> we use those you know. <laughs> well you know what i i sat in a specific spot they had three screens so you could take the slides and i was snapping pictures and i wrote in my there notes you what you what slide uh <laughs> was actually going on and it really helped because i've you know in preparing for for this today i've gone back and looked at my pictures and when they cite specific references in their talk, I encourage people when they give oral presentations to give 
a sufficient citation in a sufficiently sized font so that I can scribble it down. <laughs> you know what I see people doing now? They take their tablets, their iPads, and they have yeah. an application they can write on, and then they'll snap a, pic- a picture of the slide right into the page, and they can wow. write next to it. So they have yeah. the whole talk. I, I've seen people do that at talks. It's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so um, as I was picking out the key papers, and there's going to be a theme to my discussion, is I want to share with you the some of the quality of the abstracts that were uh, presented. The, this first one is entitled The Antithrombic Therapy in Deep-Seated Staphylococcal Infection. So one of the first things we all learn about Staph aureus is some are coagulase positive. And in fact, the way the abstract begins, and I quote, a hallmark of S. aureus is the ability to generate thrombin activity through the secretion of two prothrombin activating molecules, staphylocoagulase and von Willebrand factor binding protein, which bind to human prothrombin to form the enzymatically active staphylothrombin complex. So we know for over 100 years that staph aureus could coagulate plasma. I mean, it's one of the things that we teach all medical students. But the interesting thing in this paper is they showed, and this is one of these newfangled anti-clotting factors that they're, you know, advocating for people to take if you have atrial fibrillation or, you know, you need to be uh, declotted. Um, their talk, they, they actually investigated the small molecule uh, thrombin inhibitors, uh, dibigatran and agrotroban, uh, and they actually inhibit staphylothrombin activity. And what they learned is that the pharmacological inhibition or the absence of thrombin, staphylothrombin, reduced S. aureus virulence in vitro and in vivo infection molecules and reduce the activation of platelets by staph aureus. So now you begin to, you can do shoe leather epidemiology and ask yourself the question, are the people who are on dibigatran less likely to develop a staphylococcal deep-seated abscess than people who are on Coumadin? I mean, it was absolutely fascinating the way they laid out the data associated with this and I turned to Joe and I asked him did he know about this because Joe is a you know a treating physician and I said you know you guys always pick up on these cute little empiric observations and begin to exploit them and what, what did Joe say well you know in, in all fairness too uh, the person who has been most interested in platelet staphylococcal interaction uh, Arnold Bear in his lab out at uh, UCLA uh, had a paper in, in JCI several years ago showing that in opposition to kind of popular concepts that certain anticoagulants, in this case aspirin, actually reduced the morbidity in rabbit endocarditis. Hmm. So that brought everybody Jeez. back to the first page, you know, and said, what the heck is going on? So it's not beyond reason that we may come full circle in time, particularly with endocarditis, in trying to you know, get at something that makes that vegetation less uh, onerous and uh, fragile and fragmenting uh, to cause all the morbidity. But, you know, basically to address what, what, what Mike says, we, we now can do some more longitudinal studies along the lines that they've done with statins in, suggestions that, in suggesting that statins may actually be somewhat pr- protective against gram-negative sepsis. Oh, actually, this reminds me. Victor Nizé, whom you mentioned earlier, at one point thought that statins also work to inhibit the synthesis of the, um, of the pigment of Staph aureus. Anything happen with that? Uh, that's interesting. It's well, a carotenoid, that, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I mean, it looks it it looks like uh, 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 staphylococcal areolysin is going to be challenged a little bit, uh, admittedly by by a lesser molecule, silver. Uh, in one of the uh, papers presented, uh, there's a new species. Uh, it, it, what is it, Mike? Agrementins? Or I'm, I don't yeah. quite have it right. But it's basically a silver pigmented producing staphylococcus uh, hmm. uh, 
Elio. And oh. it, by darn, you see it right there on the uh, blood auger plate coming up just as the, the gold staff aureus does. Uh, but to uh, answer the question, there is some work going on about whether the aureolysin itself uh, is a, uh, you know, is a virulence factor. Uh, mm. I, my simple minded view of it is there are plenty of other horrible virulence factors, uh, so that its own, uh, you know, its own pigment uh, may not have to act that way, but these little critters only have so many genes. So they probably use them all for multiple. Or maybe, maybe the, the, the pigment, the carotenoid pigment serves to, uh, sop up, uh, oxygen species or something like that. Right. So that was the idea. So it's not a variant factor in terms of damaging directly, but it may be a survival factor, a fitness factor, I think it's called, for the bug. Well, as I tried, you know, Vincent and I had a stream of consciousness at, on the poster floor at ICAC, and so when, I, when he asked me to do this, I went back and really tried to put the whole meeting into perspective, and... Um, the buzz in the meeting was all about um, the staphylococcal vaccines, and there have been a number of of uh, vaccine trials. So there are no vaccines at the moment, right? There are no vaccines at the moment. Okay, and and it gets worse, right, Mike? And it and it gets <laughs> worse or better depending upon if you're the glass half empty or the glass half full kind of an individual. And so they had a commercial symposium. Uh, in which uh, I think it was just underwritten to help defray the cost of registration, in which um, they were t specifically talking about uh, the vaccines and the targets associated with um, staphylococci. And one of the uh, speakers w actually has written this tremendous opinion article that appeared in the frontiers in cellular and infection microbiology. And when I went back after his talk and read this article, it really summarizes the scope of the meeting down to the sessions almost. And his name is Fabio uh, Bagnoli, uh, Sylvie Berthollet and Guido Grande, and they're all associated with Novartis vaccines and diagnostics in Siena, Italy. And in this perspective article, he really, or the authors really lay out the issues before the staphylococcal community, and most importantly, the issues before vaccinologists trying to develop good vaccines. And if you just look in this article at the blue uh, topic headings, um, the first one specifically says antigens tested in clinical trials generate only partial protection. And this was the first phase three clinical trial in which they took uh, staph aureus capsular polysaccharides and they took two. Uh, type 5 and type 8, which are CP5 and CP8. So we've all been to basic vaccine school where we know that polysaccharides are weakly imagenic and the best way to get them to perform a little bit better is to conjugate them to a protein. So what these folks did, and this was the study that was called Staphvax by NABI Biopharmaceuticals, they conjugated to to the exotoxin a of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So it's a simple one target, either polysaccharide type 5 conjugated to XOA or polysaccharide type 8. So these are single antigens. And the take-home message was it failed. CP8 uh, is only expressed in 80% of um, the circulating strains of staphylococci that cause um, Staph aureus that causes disease, and they speculated then that the poor protective efficacy was associated with the antigen um, because, and that that significantly affected the trial. So this and was that, a human trial, Michael. This was a human trial. Okay, wow. several. There were several Nobby trials. One particularly in dialysis patients mm -hmm. uh, that seemed to work at first, and the FDA went back at them, and their their subsequent trials did not show efficacy. So, how do you measure efficacy? Uh, in this case, it was bloodstream infections in uh -huh. dialysis patients. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. So they're asking, does it work? Yeah, 
Right. You know, the very simple correlates uh, of immunity. And so they go on talking about um, the failures and in, in looking at uh, single targets. Um, and so the second bullet in this perspective is vaccines so far tested in clinical trials are not the best available clinical option. And specifically here, they comment on the um, the candidate that Merck evaluated in their clinical trial that uh, failed to generate protective immunity. And we heard in, a, in an additional session um, from the folks at Merck who shared the immunity. The uh, you're breaking up a little bit, uh, Michael. And and so as Michael plugs there, there, uh, Merck decided to take a, an an iron binding uh, uh, epitope and use it again as a single uh, as a single vaccine uh, a candidate and uh, spent a huge amount of money to uh, do this trial over the last ab- about four maybe almost five years, and it's come full circle with. Uh, Number one, lack of efficacy, and Mike, please jump in here at any point, lack of efficacy, but more importantly, um, some suggestion that uh, humoral immunity is is not, has not, and will not be Hmm. uh, the primary source of of defense in in humans. So it's It's kind of interesting because this is an extracellular parasite, an extracellular agent, so you would think that uh, antibodies would do just fine. Hmm. You, You would. Yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, it, you classically, isn't it true? That usually, you think when I, when humor immunity doesn't work, it's because often the agent is intracellular. Extracellular, sure. Well, for HIV, uh, there's an extracellular phase, which is yeah. where you would think antibodies would inter interdict, but in fact, it may not be the case either. No. Well, there is a literature on the ability of Staph aureus to jump intracellularly, uh, make small colony var- variants, and, 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 and live that way. But one of the things about the Merck vaccine study that's been discussed at these meetings over the last couple of years is uh, it, was, it was a huge trial, took a tremendous amount of funding, and uh, you know everybody waited with bated breath. So we're still going to learn a lot from it, but I think that Novartis has decided that that single uh, epitope vaccines probably are, is not the way to go. What what would be the target for these vaccines, Joe? Would it be the carriers or would it be everyone? <laughs> I'll let Mike quote Robert Dom from the University of Chicago. Now let's see if we can get Mike back. Well, there was a uh, there was a follow up talk by Robert Dom, who's kind of been the pediatric Staph aureus guru, and Bob introduced uh, and ended his talk about uh, vaccine approaches by saying that, in his opinion, if we ever got a vaccine that worked, all children would be candidates, Vincent. So ah. that answers that part. Okay. I, think, I think in adults, you would take those people at higher risk, which is probably about 20% of our population, including the immunosuppressed, if they can make good cell-mediated immunity, mm-hmm. uh, and dialysis patients, patients with prosthetic uh, uh, materials, which now after age 50 is about 50%. Of, uh, of at least Americans, and then people who have other special risks like with eosinophilic uh, uh, skin diseases, psoriasis, mm. and other types of barrier, you know, barrier-altering mm-hmm. disease. Right. Mm. One other little thing to add, uh, Elio, along what you brought up, was there are some very nice mouse studies now uh, using some very well-defined uh, animals that show that uh, cell-mediated immunity in and of itself is certainly uh, uh, necessary for defense against Staph aureus uh, a superficial infection. So we are off into a whole new, I think, most wonderful area. Yeah. So you think that we, we haven't paid enough attention to the intracellular phase of Staph? I mean, obviously, when they get phagocytized, they're intracellular. Well, it's, it's, right. it's, the, wonder, it's the wonder of how these the the quote from his his article is staph aureus immune invasion factors may represent a major challenge in developing uh, efficacious vaccines i don't necessarily think it's the whole intracellular thing i think it's because of the plethora of virulence factors and it's nizay's figure that's in that 2007 article, and you have that figure posted on uh, your Small Things Considered blog, 
when uh, they talk about staphylococci is that this microbe, it, uh, the critical aspect is the fact that these factors have human specificity. For example, SEIN, CHIPS, and SAC directly or indirectly inhibit C3 convertase, C5A receptor, and C3B respectively of complement, which are all human specific. So you begin your work in animals, and the problem then becomes that you think you have a good target, but then the staphylococcus, they say, well, we, we can deal with this. We, we know um, how to interact with complement. We, we know how um, to deal with it. And in fact, uh, what they're advocating is that we need development of improved animal models. And that was the conversation I had one day at lunch uh, with a, a group from Germany that we specifically said, we got to get rid of these damn mouse models. And I think the only model that is relevant is the rabbit endocarditis model, which is, you know, really pretty horrific to, to do. And in fact, going, and then I went and read this article by Bagoli and uh, what he says is development of improved animal models such as humanized mice in reliable surrogates of protection such as the opsonic phagocytosis assay is another critical aspect that the scientific community needs to add to increase the likelihood of success of a staph vaccine. And looking at this, it really goes back to some of the other twins that we have had on the role of TH17 cells. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what people have begun to show is TH17, TH17 cells were necessary for vaccine-induced protection against Staph aureus infection by enhancing neutrophil recruitment to sites of infection and the killing of bacteria. And when you begin to put this all into perspective, you, you begin to see how, why this conference was so um, interesting in the sense that you had all of the folks who are doing the fundamental basic science and they're publishing in, in the literature, they're, they're showing collectively. And what this conference did is they brought it all together for the first time. We are putting together those attributes of Staph aureus that confer pathogenicity, and a big one is how it succeeds in evading the immune system. Question I was left with after listening to the uh, the two sessions on on the vaccine is: Will Staph aureus teach us how the human microbiome is interacting with us and for us, in spite of our immune system? The whole immune evasion strategies, but it may be. Im it may be a primitive form, if you will, of tolerance, thinking about why our immune system doesn't recognize our own proteins. And again, this could be tolerance of, of how these commensals interact. And the way this group finishes this review article on, or this opinion on the failures of the Staph aureus vaccines, they argue that almost every good vaccine is going to require uh, a good adjuvant. And uh, traditionally, adjuvants have been used to increase antibody-mediated responses, but we've sort of gotten away from putting adjuvants into things because of the fact that it makes the vaccine reactogenic or people don't like the sore arm. And But they speculate that the important role of adjuvants might be in stimulating T cells and that's what's so important. Um, specifically, uh, they cite a paper which shows that the response generated by one particular adjuvant, uh, which is an oil and water emulsion, MF59, uh, skewed the immune response towards Th1. Um, and so you begin to see how it's very important to look at the entire 
elephant, trunk and all, to try to understand how to make uh, a vaccine. So the take-home message with the, with the vaccine sessions was, first, you need more than one ad antigen in the cocktail that you're going to immunize against. Secondly, you cannot discount the role of the innate immune system involved in this. B cells uh, may be important, but really it's the cellular arm of the immune system interacting with that T cell component that is really likely going to help the neutrophils uh, clear the bugs from uh, the or prevent the infection from going system wide, if you will. And, you know, this one little opinion article really, from my perspective, really set the tone of how the conference was um, laid out and whether or not um, the organizers actually had seen this. This, this article uh, was published in February of this year, but um, this group from Novartis Vaccines really, I think, helps um, the scientific community really begin to infer what's going on uh, with with uh, staph aureus from the perspective of vaccines. They're very positive in this article. They say at the end that there's no reason to think it's impossible to make such a vaccine. What do you think, Joe? Well, just to spin off of that um, implication and, and, and inadvertently give you a little insight into one other piece of the conference going going from the sublime to the pedestrian uh, there is a whole new science of networks that has now entered the staphylococcal field and Frank Lowy at Columbia uh, gave one of the plenary sessions on his work in understanding these networks networks among um, uh, regular community based people networks among prisoners networks among drug addicts in the uh, South Bronx and a fascinating uh, uh, intertwining of, of these groups. I, I got two themes out of that. Part of the Staph aureus genome is very, very heavily conserved, and that the so-called clonal clusters of ST30, ST5, and ST8 are in, and are continuing to spread around the world. But they won't do it forever. There will be replacement of these conser even conserved areas. And the other implication that these networks also allow for very facile involvement and interjection of a huge amount of, of, uh, of mo mobile DNA that kind of forms the other part of the, of the staph genome. So I think the challenge of vaccine science is to come up with a, with a, with a decent vaccine that will protect people against the, you know, the current menace but also have implications for uh, a, a, generic, a generic role in, in protecting against uh, uh, the other multiple factors uh, that are evolving in, in Staph aureus. But I just wanted to add the, the plug that I've been, I've been interested in networks for a long time, and Mike and I have been talking about this for 10 years, and we're really trying to understand how not only the network of organisms, but all the network of humans interact informing, uh, you know, a much larger uh, host, path, host pathogen interaction. Uh, Frank is my colleague here at Columbia, of course. Oh, yeah, sure. Sh should get him on TWIM sometime and talk about that work. Very interesting oh, stuff. It's one of the cooler talks, and it really shows how important uh, the people are that you have in your laboratory. Because what Frank described is how he has this one super interviewer who becomes every patient's best friend <laughs> literally figures out who they see which coffee cart they use who they interact with within the neighborhood and that's how he was able to make some of the most seminal of his observations simply because of the skill yeah uh, the networks uh frank has uh frank has made made the bed stuyverson area uh uh you know uh a, a reputable yeah. and, and, and the way he's pulled uh, all these networks together. Um, but it, it's going to be a real challenge, I think, understanding all the networks that these Staph aureus strains uh, 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 move through. So, Michael, you had a third bullet point. I had a third bullet point. Um, this, that's, why it's, that's why you want to call this a three-star pathogen because you had... No. No? The, the three-star pathogen yeah. was because uh, 
the conference had its um, conference dinner at a three star restaurant. Paul oh, Bucco's oh. Paul Bucco's uh, famous restaurant that was up on the river, and uh, it was really um, uh, quite a quite a show. With uh, it was almost German in its uh, presentation. It had a you know a a brass band and a jazz band. It it was really a, quite interesting. But no, the 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 three points I had was uh, we had. Um, I had a tremendous sense of of deja vu when uh, uh, Daniel LaFontaine from the Department of Biology at the University of uh, Sherbrooke in Quebec, Canada, talked about novel riboswitch ligands Hmm. that acted as selective inhibitors of guanine-related metabolic pathways. Now, guanine, we all know, is involved in nucleic acid biosynthesis. And it's essential for life. But living in a person, you would affect that they have rich media in people and that they could uh, use the salvage pathway to get everything they need. Well, um, this individual, through this uh, riboswitch, which is uh, fancy transcriptional attenuation due to RNA topology, it forms a, a complex RNA structure that uh, when guanine is in excess, it sits in the middle of this stem and loop structure and prevents its uh, transcription of the downstream genes, which is involved in making guanine-related metabolic pathways. And so they found a uh, inhibitor that would competitively uh, compete and they found that it had uh, antimicrobial activity even in, even in people where you would have a uh, complex mixture. And they presented uh, a classic metabolic pathway, uh, the scheme representing the action. Uh, the compound they had was PC1 on the Staph aureus guanine pathway. And uh, once upon a time when I was working on bacterial protein export, I defined a similar RNA element, uh, though it was uh, translational attenuation. And the protein I was working on was SEC-A, was interacting with its messenger RNA, very similar the way guanine was acting, interacting with this messenger RNA. And so it opens up these new regulatory elements and... Uh, what this study uh, and the the data that he's described in exquisite detail shows for the first time of the ability to make an antibiotic that targets a riboswitch. I mean, wow. we, we, we've had antibiotics that go after protein, sw- protein synthesis, but this now is going after a riboswitch. And... It, it it really does it bind what, RNA? Is that the idea? Yeah, it the guanine interacts with the RNA, and and this uh, uh, inhibitor mm-hmm. actually interacts or agonist interacts with it. Yeah. So this gives the 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 whole opens up this whole new field of of new drug development that you can target specifically. Now again, the problem is going to be delivery of these drugs into a. Um, a whole person, but you know you can begin to see how um, these things will work. And these riboswitches are in Staph aureus; they're in Clostridium difficile, uh, of course, which we have is at at epidemic proportion. So you had what Joe was just talking about these these networks of describing how Staph is moving through Brooklyn, and then the next talk is talking about. Uh, Foundational molecular biology introducing riboswitches to to control things, and my third bullet in this three star menu, and which is why this was a four star conference, was um, Richard Novick, the elder statesman of staphylococcal biology, um, gave a fantastic talk, and everyone was playing the two degrees of separation between them and and Richard Novick because. Anyone who is in molecular biology has, of course, cited Novick's papers on plasmids, and um, he continued to present a uh, 
really very stimulating talk. And in fact, the the content of his talk was just recently published in the PNAS early edition, and it's entitled Staphylococcal Pathogenicity Island Interference with Helperphage Reproduction is a Paradigm of Molecular Parasitism. And rather than try to rush through this, um, I think we, we may want to take this up as a, a separate twim unless Joe wants to comment on sappies and and all of this um, wonder with uh, uh, the pathogenicity islands being controlled and interacting with the phages of staphylococci. Oh. I'll just emphasize the um, uh, just emphasize the way uh, this mobile DNA is is jumping in and now uh, having such facilitation with phage. So we're really up against a uh, a very singular uh, but just terrible. Uh, commensal that it, it is a, a god awful pathogen as well, and we have all these new elements that can be brought in uh, that mixes in with the whole thread of uh, of global uh, uh, global interaction, air travel, and all that kind of stuff. So it kind of all comes together very nicely, I think, with the Staphylococcus. Well, we have we'll have you back, Joe, and you can get into this in more detail. Sounds like oh, it, that's very kind. Sounds like an interesting topic. I just want to mention that uh, September twenty eighth. The Skirball Institute will hold its 13th annual symposium. It's called Mighty Microbes Menace to Marvel in celebration of Dr. Richard Novick. And the speakers will be Bonnie Bassler, Nancy Craig, Fernando de la Cruz Calahorra, Ralph Isberg, and Richard Losick. Not bad. Not a bad program, right? Not bad, not bad. And he will, and he will, that, uh, Dr. Lo, uh, Novick will certainly uh, give as good as he's going to get from those folks. Uh, I'm sure he'll, <laughs> I'm sure he'll give a, a, a fantastic talk. And my good friend Bonnie had better start working on her slide soon. He's a tough guy. I remember t- oh, yeah. uh, giving a seminar down there. He sits in the front row and asks really tough questions. That's where he That's sat exactly at That's exactly what meeting. happened. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> I have to be t- let me diverge just for a minute and tell you a Richard Novick story. Uh, so in 1981, we found that if you made a, a, a cDNA clone and put it in a plasmid of the entire polio genome and put that into cells, it would make virus, right? Infectious viral mm. DNA. A seminal finding. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So uh, Richard Novick at the time was on the recombinant advisory committee of the NIH. And he said, this is why we cannot let recombinant DNA be done unchecked. This is in E. coli. It could get into your gut. And where does polio replicate in your gut? <laughs> so he was using my result as, as one reason to be really, really careful. It, it was, was an interesting time. It was. And in retrospect, of course, nothing happened. And, but it's always good to be safe. And now oh. we have a, a reconstructed, we have several reconstructed viruses to oh, raise the same issue, don't many, we? Many, yes. Okay, Michael, that was great. And Joe, thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm sure that was just a little bit of the, the whole great meeting, but it sounded great to me, and I'm glad that uh, you guys could do this for us. I have a few emails I'd like to read before we wrap this up. And the first one is uh, for you to answer, Michael. Okay. Uh, It is from Sarah, who writes, Hi, Twimologists. I just found this wonderfully instructive paper on concepts of bacterial ecology that are relevant to the antimicrobial resistance problem. Uh, The author mentioned the existence of genes conferring resistance to metallic ions like copper, which reminded me of the discussion about copper surfaces from Twim Episode 1. I hate to ask because it involves chemistry, which we all took ages ago, but could you comment on this? A lot of papers about copper resistance in bacteria came out before Y2K, such as the above papers reference number 47. But this paper just talks about metabolism of ionic copper, which is different than metallic or solid state copper, if I remember right. However, a 2004 paper in BMC Microbiology suggests that metallic copper releases copper ions, which are transferred into bacterial cells when a bacterial suspension is incubated in a copper vessel. So is it futile 
to celebrate the antimicrobial properties of copper surfaces, or is metallic copper reliably antibacterial by brute force, able to overcome any resistance gene that lets bacteria metabolize copper ions? Thanks uh, from Sarah. Sarah has done a tremendous job talking about the demon in the closet, which we're always concerned about with resistance to resistance developing against metallic copper. And uh, I think um, it's able to overcome this by brute force simply because the metal is actually acting mechanistically a little bit different, causing the bacterium to uh, use it as an electron sink, which then results in the formation of free radicals inside the cell. I'll call to her attention papers by um, Bill Keevil's group out of the University of Southampton in the UK in which he is able to show that with metallic copper, and it's, it's an issue of how the experiments are done, but Bill in his elegant papers that were published in Applied and Environmental Microbiology and a few other well-respected peer-reviewed journals with these these dyes, he's actually able to measure the free radical formation and the fracturing of DNA. And because the mechanisms are multifactorial, that is, you peroxidate the membrane, you uh, oxidize or bleach the proteins, and you begin to cleave DNA, all as a consequence of the generation of free radicals, as a result of the bacterium losing its um, ma- charge balance uh, due to the fact that the metallic copper is serving as an electron sink in concert with the copper ions that are being simultaneously transported into the cell that are also adding to the conundrum, the cell effectively dies very quickly from at least four separate mechanisms in which copper interacts with the microbe. Now, it's never safe to say never. It's uh, unlikely that we'll see the evolution um, in real time of uh, resistance to copper if you put it into a, a clinical setting simply because the selection pressure is uncoupled from where the microbes are in the sense of um, the patient where they will be able to effectively hide where you don't have the high dose of of copper. Uh, We think the best way to explain the use of copper is by um, simply reducing the environmental burden of microbes so you reduce the opportunity to inoculate the patient. In the poster that Joe and I presented, along with our co-authors Ken Sepkowitz from Memorial Sloan Kettering and Cassie Salgado from our institution here, we describe um, the staphylococcal population that we harvested uh, during our sampling, uh, and we didn't see any uh, emergence, specific emergence of strain type or resistance uh, to copper um, in our particular study. And that was, um, it was um, Hmm. an overview of approximately the three and a half years that we did, um, took clinical samples from our clinical environment and measured uh, the differences that we saw between copper and non-copper rooms, and there was really no difference between the two. If there was an emergence of resistance, we would have expected to see a shift in the population, or at least that was our hypothesis, and said we had um, about 3,000 separate samples in each arm of the study, and there was no statistical difference between the two populations of of uh, principally staph epidermidis that we saw, we only were able to recover MRSA five total times uh, on copper surfaces the entire time we were there, and yet we had plenty of patients that and plenty of opportunities to to see MRSA. So, nice. Sarah wrote a tremendous question. She summarized the literature uh, well, 
And uh, I think she came to her own answer. It's actually brute force that uh, does the poor microbe in. Sarah is an RN and an infection preventionist. So she, she knows what she's talking about there. Uh, the next one is from Peter, who writes, I'm not sure if the BBC program Horizon is available in America, but I found the recent edition on combating antibiotic-resistant bacteria very interesting. Of particular note were the interviews with Dr. David Harper of Amphil Amplify Biosciences in England on the development of bacteriophages to fight bacterial infections, and Professor Bonnie Bassler of Princeton University, investigating using antagonists to bacterial quorum-sensing compounds to moderate their pathological effects. And he gives us links to both of these. And he says, I think these scientists would make good guests for TWIM. For sure. We'd love to have either one of them on. So thanks for that, Peter. And the next one, uh, this is from Bezad, who writes, It is always a delight to hear Vincent sharing these informal and incredibly informative podcast discussions of microbiology. The world should be eternally grateful for what he is achieving and making so accessible both through smartphone streaming and on the web. He engages his panelists enthusiastically as they discuss a wide range of topics important to understanding the diversity of microbes and their uh, need to understanding infection, ecology, and even climate. Hearing Alio is particularly rewarding as he is, dare I say, even more articulate than Vincent, as ah, <laughs> as he explains, no way, Jose. <laughs> as he explains his topics clearly in terms that non-experts can understand, and importantly, puts these into historical context. I do. I can't, I can't for the history because of my age. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with him here. I do hope that this message is communicated to the show's sponsor, ASM. Keep up the great work. That's very nice, isn't it, Elio? Very sweet. Very sweet. Thanks a lot. Really nice. Appreciate your sentiment. Uh, the next one's from Steve, who writes, uh, Hi, of course I immensely enjoy the podcast. Thanks for making frontline science so accessible and informative. This is something America society needs, a more intimate, clear-eyed look at science and scientists in action. Are there transcripts available for the TWIM podcasts? If not, is this something planned or in process? If not, I would help transcribe and index the text to the audio video files. Wow. Well, Steve, over uh, on TWIV, my other podcast, we have some volunteers who do that. So if you're willing to help, we'd be happy to have you uh, transcribe. And it goes for others as well if you're interested in transcribing them. We don't have the f the funds at the moment to to pay for it, but we'd love to get volunteers. So thanks for the offer. And the last one is from Abhinav, who writes, Why do only a few bacteria out of billions act as endophytes by entering the tissues of plants? Wow. Uh, I thought you might... Do you know, Elio? Of course, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> this is a but, Talmudic uh, question. It is. It's a Talmudic question, if there ever was one. But, you know, just in general, um, specialized habitats tend not to be colonized by all that many different species. I mean, there is a, for every specialized habitat, there has to be a somewhat specialized organism. Uh -huh. So I think the, the answer is, it's not Elbroth. So not everybody can go under those conditions and, <laughs> I love that. Vincent, can I say one thing? Of course. The, uh, the surface of the leaf is in particular very interesting in uh, answering that question so that mm. these, these substances that, that block penetration uh, by leaf pathogens, uh, I think in this case it's a matter of brute force. That is, um, uh, the leaf... You know, the leaf is healthy for a certain amount of its life. And then that, that little first breakdown, it gets a bit of a penetration. And then, of course, the mold comes in. So uh, there are a lot of factors. And I learned this from my, when my one son was an eighth grader and he did the leaf experiment. <laughs> and they don't get infected very easily. Great. No, they don't. All right. Well, we always appreciate getting uh, questions and comments. We love to uh, read them here on the show. If you're interested, you can send one to twim t-w-i-n at twiv dot tv you can find twim on itunes at the zune marketplace and at microbeworld.org slash 
TWIM. And over there at the Micro World site, we have our show notes where you can find links to things that we talk about uh, here on the episodes. Uh, there's also a, a app for your phone. You can stream the episodes to your iPhone or Android device. You can find that over at microworld.org as well. If you like what we do here, the best thing you can do to help us is to go over to iTunes and rate the program. And if you, if you give us a rating or a comment there, uh, that makes us stay on the front page of the directory and more people can discover us to spread the word about microbes. Joseph John, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. I'm in total admiration of, of all three of you. I think it, this is fantastic. Well, we have a good time. It was, was fun talking to you. You really brought a lot of a lot of a new dimension into it. For Very sure. nice. I would say that uh, you're partly responsible because your 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 writings throughout the years have always been a great stimulus to me, especially the books. Thank you. Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure, of course. Good to have you back. Thank you. It is nice. And Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Vincent and Elio uh, and Joe as well. And I just want to tell the audience that I didn't have to twist his arm too hard to come over. But uh, <laughs> because we both had such a, a tremendous time uh, attending this conference in Lyon, France. And it was a real treat to have uh, had an opportunity to hear the Staphylococcal community really push the boundaries of our science. Did I have to twist your arm, Michael, to, to get you to review the meeting? No. Good. <laughs> no. And it wasn't torture. Good. No, we, we, we just have we, a good time. We tried our best. We tried. We tried. But your buddy there uh, rescued you a few times. Always. From the torture. <laughs> I also want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for supporting TWIM. Thanks to Communications Director Barbara Hyde and Chris Kandayan and Ray Ortega for all their help behind the scenes. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. <laughs>